again. <laughs> All right, welcome everyone to the first ever SC Cincinnati Town Hall at Forth and Vine, a first financial community. Like I mentioned earlier, there's plenty of food, beverages, Heineken, help yourself. Feel free to get up at any time throughout the program. So we're here to take your questions. I'm gonna bring our guests up in just a moment. Um, but whatever questions you have about the club, we're gonna take them from you, the audience. We also have some that were asked ahead of time, and we also have Facebook Live, it's up and running now. So we're gonna take questions online for those people back at home. Feel free to send your questions in. We'll monitor them as the event goes on. So I'm gonna bring out our first guest, SC Cincinnati President Jeff Birding. Thank you. Now General Manager Gerard Nykamp. And finally, head coach Ron Yans. All right, so we are going to start things off. Jeff Birding, if you'd like to have some opening comments. Sure. Let me just say, first of all, thank you uh, for all of our supporters being here tonight. Uh, we are an organically grown club, literally grown from our supporters taking ownership and, and helping us found the club and ultimately to earn an MLS berth. So appreciate the opportunity to have a good conversation tonight about the state of the club and the future, number one. Number two, I wanna thank uh, First Financial Bank for uh, the opportunity to host uh, this event here this evening, great new facility. Uh, and certainly uh, for Funkies uh, for, and uh, Heineken providing some uh, food and, and beverage. So look forward to a good conversation. Gerard, would you like to add something? Yes, uh, I will. Uh, good to, uh, to be here with, uh, with everyone uh, who is close, uh, connected with the club. And a very nice opportunity to get a better insight uh, in, in our club and what we are doing and what we try to build for, uh, for the future. And I hope uh, I will receive a lot of questions because uh, I'm prepared. Great. And Ron, this is officially a month now that you've been here. How's it going? It's like a company. So we will start it, Jeff, just looking at this time a year ago, at Cincinnati in the midst of a 23 game on Game Street. A year later, when you look at how your vision was for the club, how things have kind of laid out, and how everything is aligned. Well, um, the, the three pillars that we formed our club on uh, from day one, uh, and you know, so as we look from last year to this year, a winning team, a family friendly club, and a franchise that's visible in the community. Uh, that's been since day one. Certainly a year ago, we were in the midst, I think, at this point of a 23 match on Beaton Streak uh, and making our way to our first uh, league title, uh, the Supporter Shield in the USL. Um, obviously, a year later, I think family friendly part is still uh, tremendous. Uh, and we've stepped up. We now have one of the largest uh, community relations staff. Our foundation is now underway, doing some great work. So, a commitment to the community is also still. Uh, an enormous part of what we do. Uh, obviously the winning hasn't. This uh, year has been horrible uh, from that vantage point uh, and I'm committed we'll never have a season like this again. It, it's been awful. It stinks. Uh, we certainly knew that there would be a, a big transition uh, this year. Uh, Uh, MLS franchises and compared to uh, you know other teams we had side we had been winning for three years uh, as we toured around the league talking to the other expansion franchises again uh, whether you had a lot of time or not as much time you know everyone talked about uh, making sure you get your stadium right 
Uh, make sure you hire the right people in your front office who are going to lead your sponsorships, who are going to lead your tickets, who are going to lead your community, who are going to lead your branding, uh, because those are, you know, MLS. Um, when we started FC Cincinnati across the street, we had six employees. I think we had about 30 employees uh, when we moved into, uh, when we got our franchise award. You can see here, this is uh, uh, an, uh, the organization number of employees we had when we were, won the franchise award. Over the past year, you can see that's now the front office of FC Cincinnati. Over 100 employees uh, now working for FC Cincinnati. So it's been a tremendous build in, and on the stadium front, the training facility in Milford, uh, the front office build out, all of that has been, and the community uh, has been tremendous. The part that hasn't been, and that's why I'm glad to be sitting next to these guys, is the soccer side. But um, we felt two things. Number one, we felt like uh, the, the folks that had been a key part of our success, leading us and helping us earn MLS promotion, if you will, uh, had earned the opportunity to lead us into Major League Soccer. Um, we thought that that was appropriate. And in MLS, if we missed, you know, candidly, with TAM and GAM, you've seen teams in MLS that have quick turnarounds. Um, and you can see that in recent years where teams have been near the bottom and a year later, they're doing quite well competing or in the playoffs. Um, if you miss the stadium, and these other teams told us that, and some of them feel they did miss on their stadium, you do that, that'll set your franchise back a decade or more if you miss on the stadium. And we feel confident we, we've gotten it right. We're gonna have the best stadium in the league. And that's gonna fuel a level of fan experience in the stadium. It's gonna be, uh, uh, something that will be a legacy, not just for our club, but for our city. Uh, and we've worked very diligently to get that right. Uh, I'll certainly acknowledge, in retrospect, do I wish, you know, I had hired Gerard uh, a year earlier, this time last year? 100%. Uh, with what I know now, it, was it an enormous error not to hire Gerard or, uh, a year ago? 100%. Uh, but I didn't know what I didn't know and we put the focus with those 277 days on what we felt was essential to getting us right, feeling like if we needed a course correction, we'd make one, and, and we certainly have. If you guys have any questions throughout, feel free to raise your hand. We have people walking around with microphones, going in the conversation. Um, Gerard, looking at kind of the results for the year, and on social media, we've seen over the past you know, couple weeks how people seem, you know, maybe we're looking ahead 2020 and not and not focused on the remaining games in 2019 and, and same with you on how do you get the players to buy in to these remaining games and to want to win what is the mentality going in uh, I think Ron can can speak about uh, what's happening day in day out uh, in in Milford uh, at the Mer Mer Mercy Health uh, Center um, because he's training every day with 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 the team I see a lot of training sessions uh, but from that point, I'm uh, at the sideline. Uh, we're talking about humans, so not laptops, no computers. So uh, uh, they bring their uh, yeah, uh, positive and negative uh, things, and also losing is not something uh, uh, what is nice. Uh, everyone wants to be part of a winning team. So that means also for, for players. So sometimes it's hard to be, uh, uh, to be in the pitch. And, uh, uh, but we have to motivate them and they have to motivate themselves because the future is brighter uh, than uh, what we have to face now. And I think what also Jeff mentioned, it's also part of uh, the construction work we are doing, eh? building that, that foundation, uh, not forget today, but uh, uh, also looking to uh, tomorrow and after tomorrow because uh, we have to go to that phase of, uh, uh, of the club and uh, keep everyone on board. But also now you get a very good idea and insight on these players who are uh, mental, uh, very strong, and uh, are part of our future plans. Do you want to add anything to that, Ron? Gerard mentioned the day-to-day, -day, how you're working with the guys. Yeah, I remember the day I, I came to the United States. And you have your first meeting with the players. You introduce yourself and you go out on the pitch. And the first two weeks, it was so exciting. And I think for the team, it was also with some new players and with Gerard and me coming. Um, there was some kind of a new start. 
and I think we started very well with uh, a high press and uh, away game against Columbus. I think we did pretty well one hour against uh, New York City. I think they're one of the best teams. But um, after the third goal, uh, it, it was over. Um, but then you come back to the same situation. Uh, players losing a lot of games, a little bit of a, or a little bit, a disappointing season. And um, now it's time for us, the staff, to fight against that, to accept uh, setbacks or no, to accept, do not accept that you lose and never give up. We do everything to train well, to train hard, to work together, to make a good game plan, to show videos to the group, to groups of players, to individual players, talk with players, but some players, they don't know if they're still here next season. They lose a lot. So when we concede a goal, like against Dallas, you see the team is 10 minutes, it's, it's not very confidential. But um, I, I said this week, um, we, we will never give up and we, we we're kind of like the Pirates of the Caribbean. So we enter any ship and we will conquer everything we can and let them underestimate them and our players, I want the players every game to show what they can and uh, I think we, we do some rotation, we miss some players for international uh, games with Costa Rica and, and Haiti, but we're going to replace them. And I talked to everybody body individually today. Show what you can and don't think about the past, but today and tomorrow. And I think they're capable of, because there are a lot of good guys and from game to game, we will try to do everything to perform well and to show that we're proud to play and work for FC Cincinnati. So Ron, as you talk about the day today, the present, Gerard, can you kind of speak on the long-term plan that you have for this club over the next three to five years? Yes, of course. Um, we know our club goals. Eh? Uh, I bring also a nice slide for that. I hope Liz can find it <laughs> in our laptop. But um, the, the club goals, um, what we all know and eh, what we hear uh, a lot on the on the left side the the why why are we here and eh, what we want to achieve with, uh, with our club the values the culture the vision and the goals but the most important thing for us on the technical side is to uh, influence the building blocks that means to create that playing style uh, uh, to create an fcc dna and, uh, and and sometimes you you see it a little bit eh, 50 minutes 20 minutes Last time against FC Dallas, we were on the control, we had positional game, we create chances, yes, we didn't score, eh, that will also help to win games, but uh, at, it, at, there are some moments we are, are coming door, there, but we must play full halves to, uh, to increase that a lot. Of course, from creating that playing style, it's very important that we also create that uh, profiles uh, for every player and eh? we have 11 players in the pitch so every profile must be uh, identified and that's not only about looking to players and using our experience no that is also about what data can deliver <coughs> us to uh, to get the good profiles of the players we are we need for uh, for next season I think always in an organization if you're talking about uh, down office or uh, in, in Milford, on the technical side is human resource management. Try to get the good people, quality people, experienced people, potential young people uh, uh, in your uh, building and, uh, and, and, and try together with them. So we have to do it together to building that, uh, that foundation. We know the four year uh, pro project and of course also uh, uh, Saturday uh, against Toronto, the goal is to win that match and to show progress and not just 50 minutes uh, against FC Dallas or one hour against uh, uh, New York uh, City in that home game, but we have to try to do that longer. So show progress and hopefully like uh, uh, Columbus uh, last uh, uh, away game, not the last game against Columbus, but the away game against Columbus, we uh, deserve that, that, uh, that point. But of course, my three, five years uh, targets and, and vision is more also on getting that academy in place. And I will speak a little bit later in this, uh, in this conversation more about it. And uh, uh, of course, 
to be ready when we are in the, in the West End uh, Stadium. It will be step by step. We know we have the windows, the summer window and the winter window. That is the most important uh, time to um, yeah, influence the roster, to get good players in, to get also some players out eh, who don't have the future or we think is not fitting the profile. That's part of the deal, eh? that's part of professional f uh, soccer. Uh, but that's uh, day in, day out now, but also for the short and the long term uh, uh, we are focused on. Well, we do have a question from Facebook. Jeff, I'm gonna give this one to you in just a second from Paul about the stadium, so hang tight, Paul. But Gerard, you just touched on it briefly. So Vernon Norris asks about the FC Cincinnati Academy, how it's underway now, and how big do you see that getting, and how much of a focus will that be going forward? Yeah, also the academy uh, started one month uh, ago. There was a lot of preparation uh, before that, um, uh, from scratch, um, uh, and, and, and big challenge uh, uh, to get a uh, professional, well-organized, good structured uh, academy in place. I think it's a, a, a big need for, for every club because it is not to um, deliver and to produce uh, young talents and to get them in the first team, but give, the, uh, give also um, yeah, a, a face to our region. Eh? And that's Cincinnati, but Cincinnati is more than just a city. It's are the suburbs and, and uh, far uh, around that. Eh? So um, Columbus uh, is, exists longer, has their development uh, in place already. But what we will fight for getting the area for us by quality by uh, getting an, uh, an high standard uh, with a great facility um, uh, academy with good young players we have to identify we show them the pathway we will bring them to the first team that takes time uh, uh, but uh, we know that we uh, with the potential in this area uh, we, have a, we have a great future in, in, in front of us <coughs> and I want to say to everyone it's not possible now because the facility is still under construction uh, for the for the next uh, couple of months, but uh, in the future to watch uh, one of our teams. A beautiful facility for the academy to train, and with the West End Stadium being built, a goal for them to set to to look forward to playing there someday. Um, Jeff, another question from Facebook, and after this, I want I want to get your questions out there. I know you guys have some. Just raise your hand. Um, Paul Stepro asks, when will the new stadium construction go vertical? Sure. Uh, we have a, a timeline slide, so uh, thank you for the question. Uh, shows uh, some of the, uh, uh, the key dates. Uh, I think we'll see the stadium starting to come out of, out of the ground, as you can see in the fall. Uh, the deep foundation pilings are, are now uh, largely done, uh, and so you'll start to see steel coming onto the site and starting to go vertical here before too long. Uh, we're still on schedule to open uh, for the start of the season in 2021. Um, it, it's uh, going to be more than $250 million uh, privately financed, obviously with some key support from the city related to the infrastructure. Uh, and we certainly hope, you know, we've had three votes at the county commission to build a thousand car garage. We weren't going to invest $250 million in a stadium with fans having no place to park. Uh, so we're certainly counting on the county to deliver on their commitment, not only to FC Cincinnati, but to you, to our fans, uh, to the neighborhoods around our stadium so that our fans aren't parking in their neighborhood, uh, but rather parking in parking garages and parking lots that are a part of our uh, project. Uh, so we're certainly very excited. Uh, we think that it's gonna be a great environment around our stadium. Uh, some of uh, what we have underway, obviously a great uh, environment uh, in Over the Rhine, and I think you'll continue to see development happening uh, in the West End that's great for the people in the neighborhood, uh, and also certainly a great environment for uh, folks coming to our stadium. I'll, I want to go back to what I said earlier. You know, our, our stadium, I, I want to give some uh, thought of why get it right, okay, and why the focus. Um, MLS is a sport in our country that relies on local revenue. You, you, you have to generate your revenue locally. There's not these big national deals that come in to help you pay for your players. Um, so for us, getting the stadium right meant a lot of research, a lot of work with our architects. Uh, our, we're, we're gonna announce here soon on our, uh, the kickoff of selling some of our premium seating. 
We have a brilliant experience center that's going to be on the fifth floor across the street. Every season ticket holder is being able to come down, pick out their seats in an experience center where you can literally see the view from all of your seats, making your appointments. Uh, but my point is our, our stadium, 26,000 plus seats, we hope that it will end up as the biggest soccer specific stadium in Major League Soccer. Uh, over 50 suites, over 4,500 club seats. That premium seating will give us revenue as we open the building to invest back in players, uh, could be big players, invest back into the academy uh, as we continue to grow and build out the academy. If you don't have those revenues, you don't have the ability to make those investments. I think our ownership group has shown since we've launched that we're not af afraid of spending money. Uh, we have the most ambitious stadium project in all of Major League Soccer. And we're making that investment because, again, a legacy for the city and for our club, but also to drive revenue, hopefully with the support of our fans and season ticket holders and the business community and others, to buy the seats so that we can put those uh, investments into the roster to win championships. You saw on Gerard's slide, goal number one, there was a trophy. It's to win trophies. We obviously uh, did that at the USL level, but that doesn't matter anymore. Now we need to do it at this level. Uh, and we intend and we believe that in our plan and our staff, and certainly that we will have the resources with the new stadium to be big time investors into the quality, into the talent, present this city with championships. Thank you very much. I get that question a lot, so I'm glad you, you asked that. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so let, let me offer, uh, I'll, I'll give you the easiest answer is 26,000 is what we can afford. We're paying for this stadium ourselves. For, uh, if you remember when we initially launched our franchise uh, bid with the expansion committee, we had a 21,000 seat stadium. That was after our first season as a club in the USL. We drew 17,000 a game, so 21,000 seemed ambitious. Our second year in the USL, we did 21,000. And we're thinking, whoa, maybe 21,000 is not enough. Well, then as we were awarded the bid and we started making plans, last year we did almost 26,000 a game. And so immediately, I, I, I remember the scene in Jaws, we're going to need a bigger boat. <laughs> Literally, I said to Carl, we're going to need a bigger stadium. Well, it's easy to say that, but an extra 5,000 seats to go from 21,000 to 26,000 cost over $50 million, <coughs> privately financed. Our owners, maybe new owners, coming in uh, with that. Um, so th that's, uh, in its most basic level, that's the answer. Having said that, we think 26,000 is the right size. Uh, 26,000 with LA Galaxy will be the biggest soccer specific stadium uh, in the U.S. Obviously, there's some NFL buildings, Canadian football, uh, a, a little bit different. But you, you see LAFC 21, a lot of the new stadiums in the 21 to 22, including some of the new ones about to come on, are, are a little bit smaller. You, you do want to have a level of scarcity. Candidly, it, it puts a value on being a season ticket holder. Tickets are maybe hard to come by. We will always make sure the 26 gives us room, capacity to have seats that are family friendly in our pricing to make sure we protect the floor, uh, that the prices, that there's price points, plenty of seats that people can afford. Um, having said that though, the new stadium, I just mentioned 4,500 club seats, over 50 suites, a lot of premium seating. Uh, and so with that, we think there's a good balance of, of, of seats that are higher priced, that will help us fuel investments into the roster to be able to compete, to win. Uh, but also make sure we have enough seats at lower price point, the, the entry price uh, that is protective of being inclusive to be soccer for everyone. Um, ultimately, we think that that's the right number for now and we can afford it. Time will tell if we continue to grow, uh, maybe we will need more. But for right now, in our history with the new stadium, we think that's the right number. Hi. Um, um, on the uh, the presentation that was right there, there was talk about uh, the reserve roster, uh, the possibility of that coming out in 2020. We know that over the past year, the USL has not only developed its championship 
tier, but also its USL1 tier. And I was wondering if there's been any sort of ideas in terms of what FC Cincinnati's feeder team would look like in the future. <coughs> we should have a, a team a roster. Uh, means the this slide, yes, he'll do very good <laughs> list. Um, I talk about the academy, the foundation of, uh, of every club. We start now one uh, month with this uh, uh, academy. Of course, we are doing our scouting for the region to identify new players, and hopefully in the, two, in the future, we can do that also international. Uh, then we have the first team. It's also a roster. We are working now with that roster and try to improve the roster every, every time. But the reserve team, or an under-23, is needed for the future, because if you have an academy and now it stops at the age of 70 years old, maybe in the near future we will have an under-19, and from the under-17, under-19, you have to go directly to the first team. That's too big cap. And some players, uh, uh, Frankie Amaya is one of them, they have the talent to make that step directly. But physical-wise, normally, you have to stay an, a sidestep. That could be that uh, a reserve team. So because then, if, we, if a player is going to, uh, through the reserve team, we will not lose all that talent we have to produce in uh, uh, our academy. So coming in the first team, hopefully every year one or two players in the future. It's now too quick to say that, but in the future we have to do that. And from there on, let them shine in your first team, perform, make results. Hopefully uh, uh, we will uh, reach the playoffs or in the future we can go for that, uh, for that cup, the MLS Cup. And there will be a moment also to show the players. That's also what, what Jeff mentioned to get that revenue also from that, eh? because we can reinvest for transfer fees in the future, again, in our academy, uh, or directly in our first team or reserve team. But that is uh, a, a very important part from our technical side, what is needed in the future uh, to uh, uh, implement between the academy and the first team. I'll just add a, a little bit of a nuance. Um, so whether, to your question, whether that's uh, we affiliate uh, next year with the USL championship team, uh, whether we uh, at some point uh, create a new uh, third division uh, team is still to be determined. Candidly, having some conversations with some of the USL clubs uh, championship who would like the opportunity to build a, a closer relationship. Clearly we have had some players that we've loaned uh, into uh, USL Championship where we think they have very quality coaches and they're going to give our players the opportunity to play. Do I think the uh, opportunity is there to grow those relationships as we look to next year? So some of our young players who aren't maybe getting first team minutes immediately have an opportunity to get more minutes uh, to help their development. Uh, that's certainly the goal. Um, and that will be some ongoing conversations as we end this year and prepare for next year. Also, also for me as a, as a head coach, I've got uh, 25 players and three goalkeepers. So every week, 15 players are playing. So you are maybe 19 years old. The step to the first team is maybe step by step, and you have to play on the right. The reserve team is the right fit, and I think also for players who come from back from injury, it's good to have games before you start again in the first team. So the reserve team for the future is very important, also for the head coach. Come back to the audience in just a second. So keep your questions fresh. I know you guys still have them, um, but while we're talking about building the roster and success in the future. Some questions are coming in on Facebook about the team seemingly planning to wait until 2021 to spend on players. Jeff Gerard, can you guys address those concerns from fans? No, that's that's uh, uh, not the goal. Eh? To to focus only on 21. Uh, we have to focus on today. Uh, what I mentioned already, the short to get points or to show progress as uh, as a team. Uh, every match we. Uh, till the end of the season and from there on uh, our focus is on next season uh, 
There are uh, uh, contracts uh, who will stop. Uh, there are uh, option uh, contracts. Uh, uh, there will be also, uh, uh, we need new players. Um, we will uh, find young players. We will have TP, so we have need all kind of players to be competitive for next season in uh, the final year in uh, Nippet Stadium. And you saw from the four we want to be ready to play for the playoffs in the, in, in the MLS. From now, you think, oh, that's a, that's a big goal. But we think, uh, uh, because it gives also opportunities, uh, uh, windows open, uh, so we can change, uh, we can bring quality in, we, uh, uh, other players can go out, uh, give us a lot of opportunities this winter to get uh, to be ready with a good preseason uh, to be ready for next season. I'll, I'll just add again. I think if you do a fair analysis of our club, we're not shy about spending money. Uh, we were a big spending uh, club in the USL, and you know, certainly last year I think we'd figured it out pretty well. Um, Certainly, to be fair, this year, short turnaround, as you know, noted, 277 days, um, 150 million for the expansion fee. We're you know, starting to pay for that 250 million plus stadium, 30 brilliant, 35 million dollars, the big build out of the front office. Uh, yeah, this year's been lean, uh, no question. Uh, having said that, we're so much further ahead now with the process. Uh, that we have established and have begun to implement under the leadership of Gerard uh, and, a, and a coach who's very experienced, focused on developing those players, um, that we feel uh, we're better, uh, I mean, we're, it's night and day from where we were a year ago uh, to, wor to where we are. And so to that question, if, if the sense is, well, the focus is on 21, well, that isn't gonna happen like that. It takes multiple windows uh, and, and to the extent that we may have, you know, a, a great deal of revenue when we're in the new stadium, you can't bring in all these new players and expect it to be in sync. We have to continue to build the foundation through all these cycles, which requires us to spend money, so that maybe there are some big time players that come in 21, but they have to have a good foundation of the roster around them uh, to be successful. We will start uh, next year having revenues come in, so it's not as if it all just happens in 21. Some of those revenues, again, we're going to start selling suites and club seats and sponsorships are coming on board towards the new stadium. But some of those revenues come in now towards next year. Uh, and so we feel we're going to be very well positioned to have the resources to continue to build the foundation, as Gerard said, the goal to make the playoffs next year. Time next year, we're competing for the playoffs, not just riding where we're in that uh, we're a strong club ready to compete uh, for championships in the new stadium. Take another question from the audience. So in this window coming up, uh, transfer window, what two positions would you, are you going to focus on? On all the 11 positions, uh, because wait, uh, the team we have now, and of course, we had matches, uh, uh, a lot of training sessions, uh, three coaches this year. And, and now, uh, now we're working already two weeks. And uh, to define the, the, yeah, the white blocks, so the needs for the, for the positions. Uh, and, and yeah, that's, that's an go ongoing process. Uh, we can say we need a right winger or we need a an, an left fullback. But uh, we have to see also what the market is doing. Eh? What is the going forward. 
we are talking every day, um, especially the last weeks of our way of playing. And we, we like to be in control of games, so having more position, that means that you do the building up from behind to create an extra man, but um, you don't do it to keep possession, but to score goals. So when you can play forward, instead of wide or backwards, we want to play you forward, but we, have, we want to create um, the positions in the field that we can play forward and go forward as a team. If we don't have the ball, you want it back because you don't play football like this silly sport, American football. You only <laughs> defend and you don't play when you have the ball. So for me, soccer is much more interesting. Sorry about the football guys. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, we, the, but we're talking uh, on every position which profile we need for, uh, let's, let's see, let's say left fullback. Mm -hmm. And left fullback or fullbacks on both sides, they should have, have speed. They can run a lot because they have to defend, but also do the overlap. So you have to physically, you have to fit into that. But on every position, we, we want players with a good personality and good mentality. Yeah. And that's also part of the profile. So. Um, I think in, in due time, um, I think in preseason, we can use maybe slides, but I hope you can see it on the pitch, because I'm the coach, they're more for the longer term, that you can see it on the pitch how we want to play. And, and I liked a lot the intensity of the, the first two games, mm -hmm. and um, that, that's what we should keep, because when you press, you have to do it intense, and not only on 90%, and not with 10 players, with 11 players and I hope we can show that that you see in the end a lot of shots on goal and especially more shots on target and more goals in this season and, and I think this season for me I, I'm only here for one month but they made a great thing for me to make things better because it's not good at the moment and I'm part of that too and, and I hate losing but I love improving and making progress, and that, that's what we want to do. And everyone here loves seeing <coughs> goals scored also. <coughs> Anyone else have a question on here? Yeah. So your, your vision is to be an ambitious, disruptive club. Um, I, I certainly love the ambition and I see it. I'm not sure I see the disruption. Um, have you given thought to having a women's team so they could really rise together? Yes, uh, I'll, I'll t handle that one. Uh, since the very first days of our club, we've uh, been a big investor in girls soccer in this region. We uh, are so proud that uh, the, the best girl, uh, young women in greater Cincinnati play uh, the Cincinnati Development Academy. They travel all over the United States with FC Cincinnati on their jerseys. Uh, and that's because we're a big partner. We're proud of, of that partnership. Uh, we've had some uh, initial discussions about NWSL. Uh, certainly, uh, back to ambition, uh, when we open uh, the West End Stadium in 2021, uh, we intend to have conversations with NWSL regarding their own expansion. Uh, and if they are interested in expansion, we'd like to have those discussions about what those terms would be to bring an NWSL franchise uh, to uh, the West End Stadium, so that just like young boy players in our region uh, can uh, dream big of maybe playing for their hometown team, we'd like to have that same opportunity provided to the young women in Greater Cincinnati. Uh, again, and that uh, is best we can at this level with supporting the, the, the girls DA, uh, the opportunity to slide that into the FC Cincinnati DA to support a professional team at the West End Stadium would be brilliant. Um, and it's something that Carl and our ownership group certainly uh, are interested in. I just want to offer, until then, maybe there's some opportunities. We brought the women's national team to Cincinnati. We're looking for opportunities to continue to do that or bring other sorts of uh, exhibitions of the very finest women players uh, to Cincinnati. Uh, and, and so maybe there's opportunity next year to do that as a continual building block uh, here in Cincinnati. I just have to give a shout out to Rose Lavelle, one of the greatest players in the world, 
is right here, hometown, uh, so proud to call Cincinnati her home. Uh, she's such a great ambassador for women's soccer in the world and, and an ambassador for Cincinnati. And so seeing what she represents and how she inspires uh, the opportunity to you know, have Rose maybe someday playing in Cincinnati uh, it would just be extraordinary on whatever platform. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you you know which two countries played the um, uh, the World Cup Championship? The final. The final. Do Female I soccer. Do you know the final? Yeah. yeah. We hate Rose Lavelle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We 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 do. <laughs> but we're proud of her. <laughs> We just saw her on Tuesday. Okay. Yeah, yeah. She's always happy to see people from Cincinnati. Talking, talking to her about when she's going to come back. She's always in good spirits, asking, asking about her hometown. But she's, it's great to see her on the national stage. Do you have another question on this side of the room? No. Go ahead. I'm wondering if um, any of you would be willing to pinky promise me that we will beat Columbus next season at least once. <laughs> uh, the, the last game was uh, only the first time that Columbus beat Cincinnati, so I think uh, in total we are still in front of Columbus crew, but uh, for, for me, the, I think the first 45 minutes against uh, Columbus, it was very disappointing. We expected so much of the game, I think the home game was very nice to watch and, and I think 2-2 was maybe the, the the, the right result, but um, I can promise that not that we win, but that we're going to do everything to beat our friends from Columbus. Um, Jeff, question for you from Facebook, Rupesh Sharma. Can you explain why assistant coaches, so referencing Yohan Dame, Jack Stern, um, were given longer contracts than Coach John? Yes, uh, well, and, and I want to acknowledge uh, part of it was the evaluation of uh, Gerard. So uh, I'm going to have him take the part of the question. Um, l let me offer, uh, we were in a very difficult position when we made the coaching change at the beginning of the year. Not easy uh, at all. Uh, and one of the things I challenged uh, them and, and, and committed is we're going to improve the culture uh, and uh, we're going to begin to develop an identity. Uh, and we thought with those two things, results will take care of themselves, whether in the short term or the long term. Um, no successful organization, long, you cannot have long-term success, whether you're a sports team or a business, without great culture. Um, and so th that had to get uh, uh, built. Uh, and then to begin to develop the identity and teach how we wanted uh, to play. And I thought that uh, Johan DeMay stepping into that role, very challenging, uh, with the support of Jack Stern, uh, the goalkeeper coach, they did a tremendous job really steadying the ship through a very difficult time. It maybe didn't show to where we all wanted it on results, but certainly from where we were to where we uh, ended with the transition to Ron w was an enormous Im improvement. Again, whether you see the results or not, or you saw it, it, wa it was. Um, and, and so uh, we think that they have very bright futures, uh, both of them, uh, and we're very grateful for the leadership they showed uh, through those very challenging times. With that, though, I'll say, having said that, Gerard is now the head of, of soccer for FC Cincinnati, and so he has to come to the conclusion. Yeah, and, and we discussed that uh, several times. Um, human resource management, uh, uh, get the good people on the, on the bus, and I think these two uh, guys are really good persons, uh, but not only good persons, but also the quality, what we're looking for. Um, uh, ambitious, uh, very talented, uh, hard workers, uh, and they make a big progress. And uh, in, in difficult times, uh, they show also their mental strength, um, uh, looking forwards. And that is what I'm looking in, uh, in people where I want to work with. 
uh, and to be a team. Uh, so for me, it was not any doubt uh, to speak with Jeff, and we were quick on the on the same page uh, with that to to extend their uh, contracts because good people we have to keep uh, because also. Uh, the clubs around us are looking for good people, talented people, ambitious people. So give them the trust, uh, uh, the safe environment that we want to create in FC Cincinnati so we can build together, not only with, with Jack and, uh, and Johan, but also with all the others. And that is an ongoing process. Another question from the audience? I, I've got a, a comment rather than a question. Uh, this year is the first year that I've been a season ticket holder. And in previous seasons, I've come to a game here and a game there. And uh, I grew up uh, with American football like so many other people and, and just love it. But the thing that's impressed me the most, or one of the things about attending FC Cincinnati games is that it truly is a fam family friendly environment. You know, you don't hear the language, you don't hear people fighting in the stands. Now, with American football, you go to those games, you say, okay, I accept that, uh, whether it's appropriate or not. But uh, it truly is a family friendly environment. And uh, even when the players come out on the field, they do it in kind of a dignified way. <laughs> and so, it's, it's nice to have a sport where, uh, it, now the Columbus Crew game was the first time I saw anybody actually push somebody else or they got into that uh, little scramble in the, in the uh, net. But uh, I thought, wow. But it, it's, uh, it's great to have a sport where we, we have that kind of respect and you can truly bring your family. Thank you so much. It's, the, I, I said earlier, the, the three pillars we started the club from day one is we want to be a winning team because, and I, say, I just want to share, not because it's all about the players and the coaches and the staff. When our sports teams win, they do win for the city. We, we want to make Cincinnati a championship city. That's our why. Uh, we, want, we all who live here, we, we love Cincinnati. We think Cincinnati is great. We want the rest of the world, 170 countries see our games. We want them to see this vibrant, dynamic city with energetic people, with you know a positive vibe, and then ultimately with holding trophies, saying that this is a championship city, a winning city. So winning number one. Number two, family friendly. It's an environment where you can feel comfortable bringing your kids and having memorable moments uh, together, where in sporting events you have the full range of emotions. Uh, maybe a little bit this year, too much despair. But, but you have those moments that are human you know, exhilaration, and it's unifying when you're high-fiving and hugging people for great moments like we had a lot of, you know, I think of the Chicago Fire match after the, uh, Mitch saves the last PK. People are hugging and crying, and no one's asking who you voted for or where you go to church or wh where do you live. It's, it's just we're, we're connected in a human way around our pride uh, for our city. Our love of our city is, is expressed through our support for our team, so family friendly. And then we're visible in the community. We're leaning in, we're saying, hey, sports teams have an obligation to make our city better because athletes and teams can inspire um, and, and, and can be role models and can get out into the schools and get out into the community and make a difference. And we have an obligation uh, to do that. And so that, those will always be the pillars and those will always sustain you. Um, you know, we, we, we were awarded our MLS franchise. Many of you hopefully were there. Where was it? In a bar, right? It's, it, it was in a, in a brewery. And that was symbolically important. Why? Because we're not some franchise that's up on the mountain in a castle where everyone else is down, you know, on the other side of the moat. We're a community. We are a family, and it sounds cliche, but we try to operate that way. We have a fan advisory council. We have a supporter group forum. Uh, you know, we try to get out in the community and do things where we're listening and engaging, and our fans, as a result, feel some ownership. This was a community thing. No one thought Cincinnati was gonna be awarded a third major league franchise. No one thought we were gonna get this. We were the smallest market. We had no real history of soccer that anyone was aware of. And we came out of nowhere and shocked the world. Why did that happen? Because of our fans. 
because of our supporters, took it on their shoulders, said, you're darn right we're going to make Cincinnati Major League. We are going to get this bid, and we're going to show up at the games, and we're going to create this unbelievable atmosphere that's going to you know, be a siren call for people, whether they're soccer fans or not, or sports fans or not, to want to come to FC Cincinnati games. And we're going to get out in the community and make a difference because we buy into this club and what this is about. And, and when people feel that ownership, it, it can't help but then be consistently displayed in the stadium on game day. different uh, is that, that you when you're in the stands you actually hear people singing the national anthem all around you uh, you're not singing it by yourself thinking oh, I can't sing but uh, I'll, you know I mean people are singing the national anthem and it's and it's inspiring thank you it's it's uh, I've been around in Europe and it's different over here with the fans and maybe it's the Cincinnati fans but I think it's even more, it's bigger than, it's, it's uh, American fans. And you, you, you want to go to a game and enjoy yourself. And there's more, it's, it's, it's more aggressive in Europe. There's more, maybe not violent, but maybe rude, maybe more um, uh, intimidating, uh, more hatred. And I, I, I love it like it is here because you want to go to soccer to see uh, a game with your family and keep it like that because it's it's you who are making the atmosphere i loved it because i didn't know should i stay in holland or should i go i was here at the houston game and i thought amazing great the atmosphere at the bottom of the table 26,000 people and we, we are so proud of you so but I really like it, keep, keep it like that, positive. Even the rivalry against uh, Columbus mm -hmm. in, in, in Europe when you play dice, it's so, it's so, sometimes it's over the top, it's too aggressive. So keep up doing that. Actually kind of following with that, looking forward into the next place. We do have this great culture. And for many of the bands, uh, you go there three hours early to go to eat here and go there. We're going to have this wonderful area up the street. But I'm, I am wondering, I, I hope you guys have thought about, that you're, there's kind of like a touchdown place for everybody to gather together in the community at Washington Park. And I have wondered if you've worked with them, because as it is now, the, everybody does the march from Mecklenburgs and they collect people along the way. And we're known for that, and that's a very popular thing. But it has occurred to me as people have been spread, are going to be spread out in West Side and all through all our OTR, that whether they're in a supporters group or they're there with their family, hanging already in Washington Park, maybe listening to music or whatever, that one hour before the game starts, all the groups can come together at Washington Park, join there for that final march that, that's so impressive. It is. I had not heard that Washington Park. I've so, wondered about thank it. Thank you. So let, let, let me thank you so much for asking. Let, let, me, let me just to affirm your point. Um, I've been giving, uh, I've been speaking at some international sports conferences. Uh, last week I was in Vegas. A few uh, uh, months back I was in New York. Um, we've hosted some international people coming to Cincinnati to check out what this is about maybe building some soccer relationships. And the one image that people have seen is they've seen the images, whether it be from the Columbus Crew game or from the Portland game, they've seen the march. And literally, as, as folks have seen it, four or five blocks long. People accused us on international like, social media, it's a doctored picture. There's no way that's real. <laughs> like, no, it's real. And so 100%, the image that people think of with FC Cincinnati, even more than the full stadium, which is also brilliant, is they do think of the march. So a couple things. Number one, we one of the great reasons we have the Supporter uh, Leadership Forum and we have the Fan Advisory Council is they're giving us feedback on design 
of the stadium. They literally have been involved in design. So just as an example to that, you've seen the, the stadium with the grand staircase um, uh, coming off of Central Parkway. There's a reason it is so wide, because the march is going to be coming right up those steps. Okay, uh, The supporter groups have, have indicated to us that they would like to uh, gather in Washington Park uh, and lead a march there. Now, it may be similar to Mecklenburg Garden, where some people are coming from, say, Rheingeist from the north, and some people are coming maybe from some uh, bars to the south or to the east, but ultimately all meeting up in Washington Park. Maybe there's some programming on the stage there in Washington Park, uh, and, then, and, then the, and then the march in uh, coming up those steps where many supporters will go to the Bailey, which will be double the size, but others will go to their seats elsewhere in the building. So um, I think that is the benefit of having this organic uh, ownership of the club, because we literally utilize the feedback to design the stadium and the programming uh, with it. So thank you, yes. And, and I'll just offer a, a little, 100% we are concerned uh, how do we transition from Nippert, which has been a brilliant home for us, the birth the club, uh, to the new stadium? I, I think fans will enjoy having a seat with a back, and it's a little bit wider than the little 16 inches on the bench. <laughs> more restrooms, a lot more concessions. Uh, you don't have to wait in as long at lines. And I mean, I could go on and on all the brilliant upgrades. But at the end of the day, the environment at Nippert is brilliant. And so, again, working with supporter council, working with fan advisory, how do we make sure that we're doing the right things to bring the best of Nippert into the new stadium while also having fans enjoy a, a much better experience? I'm not going to offer to you today, you know, a year and a half before we open that we have it all figured out. I just commit to you that it is a high level priority to make sure we get it right. Jeff, Randy Meister on Facebook kind of does want you to elaborate a little bit. Kind of a broad question, but he said, can you talk about the new stadium and what season ticket holders can expect? Um, well, let me <laughs> just offer. We, 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 let me just say this. We are looking forward to continuing to unveil uh, seating options, and with seating options, the food program and other amenities that we're making available to our season ticket holders. So let's, we look forward to that. Um, I want to reaffirm a little point I made earlier. We now um, own the building right across the street here on uh, 4th Street at 14 East 4th Street. Uh, the entire fifth floor has uh, been uh, renovated uh, to be the fan experience the center, the stadium experience center for our, for our season ticket holders. Uh, literally every season ticket holder will have an appointment. Um, your seniority as a season ticket holder uh, will be how that is established. Um, to make an appointment at a certain time, come up to the stadium, and have an opportunity to pick your seats. Uh, and one of the things, again, we think we've done well is we have lots of different seating options. So, um, you know, some people will want to sit in premium seating, maybe some entry premium versus maybe more corporate premium. Uh, obviously, a double, ba so the biggest seats that people want to sit in at Nipper are in the Bailey. Bailey's now twice the size, safe standing. Um, w again, we've designed the stadium, so where are the drums? How are we doing TIFO, right? All of that has been designed into the building with their feedback. Hey, it'd be great if we had this. This would be a priority. Okay, architecture in the room, make notes. Let's work to make that happen. Um, I would, uh, we're working with uh, Levy. We announced Levy is gonna be the concessionaire. Um, one of the things we like about, uh, we like a lot about Levy, but they've had some high level success experience in soccer venues. Let's be honest, soccer is, is different. You have 45 minutes, uh, you have the 15 minute halftime, you have 45 minutes, you go home. And so it puts a premium on delivering product quickly. People don't want to be in line and then they miss maybe the only goal of the game. Uh, and so the efficiency of serving our fans is a real priority. Technology, what do fans have to look forward to? Technology. Um, uh, and so how that technology serves you getting maybe into the stadium more quickly, uh, how uh, 
how you get your food maybe more quickly? Um, can you get online to whether you want to upload pictures on Facebook or Instagram? Uh, or maybe get some data on um, you know, which restroom lines are, are the least crowded right now. Uh, we anticipate all those will be uh, a, enormous uh, fan uh, benefits. Um, I'll, I'll just offer, uh, obviously, our, our sponsors. Again, you want to invest in, um, in, in the players. Uh, you want to pay for this brilliant stadium. You know, we need partners. We have a great partnership here with First Financial Bank. Uh, with Heineken. Uh, we'll continue to see uh, more of those partnerships announced, a lot on the food side, uh, but also on the technology and other pieces that go directly to fan experience. I'll just offer to the group that as we talk uh, about our club, we, we say we are uh, fan and brand focused. And so what is that fan experience? As we make decisions on investments into the building, again, we're paying for it ourselves, so it's not like there's some taxpayer backstop here. What do we prioritize? And I'll just candidly say, we prioritize two things. One, does this help us deliver a supreme fan experience? If this, whatever the, this choice is, helps improve fan experience, that's something we want to invest in, number one. Number two, can we monetize this? And I say that candidly, you know, sponsors and things of like that, why? Because that pays the bills, remember, said earlier, we're not a league that there's these enormous national revenues that are going to flow in. We have to live by what we generate locally. We have to pay for the stadium with what we generate locally. We have to invest in players in our academy with what we generate locally. And so how we uh, drive investments into the building are critically important. Why? Because we will never have a season like this again. Uh, and the way that's going to happen is we're going to have a great stadium that's going to deliver an enormous fan experience for our fans but also Cannelly is going to help us monetize and drive investments back into the club. All right, we have time for a couple more questions. Yeah, um, well, thanks for being here today. Uh, one of the things I wanted to ask, um, a lot of we's are mentioned when speaking about the club, and it gets everybody excited when you speak on ownership within the city. And this city has shown up in its history for teams that have struggled, even regarding this year. And, I mean, my family personally moved back here from Texas and bought – Tickets through our boy Josh over there, wherever he went, before we even moved back here. Because I love this city, I wanted to call this my home again. So this is where the request comes in. I hear so many we's, and our stadium is going to be in the West End. Um, is there any way we can get a shirt possibly considered for first game day that said W.E. did this? And you can just comment on that from there. <laughs> well, uh, I think it's a brilliant idea. So thank you for bringing it. I, I see uh, Amir Shimoni back here. Um, uh, we sell uh, the second most merchandise of any team in all of Major League Soccer, trailing only Atlanta, which draws over 50,000 a game. Um, and you know, a big part of that is, um, you know, we have attractive colors. Uh, we have a lot of pride in our, in our club and in our city. And also, you know, people come up with some pretty cool ideas that people like. And so Amir just took note of your suggestion and uh, stay tuned. Okay. <laughs> you still have a question? Um, you, you mentioned generating revenue, and earlier you talked about once the stadium is built, possibly having a woman's team be able to play at the stadium. So that way you're generating revenue besides the. 40 or so home games, or not even that, home games that we have. Are there plans to use the stadium for other things once it's open? Are there restrictions that MLS has? There's no restrictions uh, that way, other than to ensure that we protect the quality of the pitch. Um, we're going to have natural grass. That's the way soccer should be played. Um, and we'll, we have a great groundskeeper, uh, two guys now. Um, they're doing a brilliant job in Milford, uh, and they'll do a brilliant job uh, at our West End Stadium. That's really it. But can we put Terraplast over the grass uh, to have concerts on the field? Yes. Um, so do we envision some concerts? Yes. I want to not oversell it. We're not expecting to have concerts every weekend. I'm sure there'd be some people in the, you know, in the neighborhood that maybe not like that. But will we have some musical ev uh, events? Absolutely. Uh, will we look to continue to have some, 
you know, national team with U.S. Soccer Federation. Yeah, we think we have the best stadium for U.S. soccer. Uh, you know, uh, do we anticipate playing a U.S. soccer, whether it be men's or women's, every single year in our stadium? You bet we do. Uh, do I envision that we'd have some, you know, maybe some college games, the Crosstown Shootout of Soccer, maybe some high school championships, maybe the state championships? Uh, do I envision maybe we'd have a game where, you know, our West End Pride teams get to play a, a game? Yes. Um, but I think that the overwhelming use of the building, and candidly, this is no different than the Reds or the Bengals, we'd like to see hundreds of days of year use of the building in some of the spaces. You're going to be able to have uh, private parties, literally birthday parties, weddings, wedding receptions, uh, corporate meetings, in, because we have, we're going to have, and we're so excited to roll them out soon, these very unique spaces that are going to be perfect for events. And, but it's inside. It's not on the pitch. Maybe you bring group down to the pitch for a photo. Maybe you get a tour of the locker room uh, down there. Um, you know, we're going to have a, a, a two-story team store. It'll be probably the biggest store in all of MLS uh, at the stadium. Uh, and so, you know, maybe we have special days where people come to the store, and as a part of shopping that day, you get a tour of the locker room uh, and get to go out on the field for some photo ops. Uh, maybe we bring some alumni players at that point back who maybe aren't on the roster, wrote a big part of our history, a big part of our club, and maybe they're a part of that. Uh, one of the things that I like is to open the stadium to the neighborhood. Maybe we have a movie night where, you know, people bring some blankets and you, you sit on the, the, uh, the grass and we have a movie on the big video board, family movie, um, motivational maybe. Um, but you know what I'm getting at, like those are the sorts of things. Mercy Health is going to have a health plaza there and so they're going to do screenings and, and health care uh, delivery. Uh, for people in the neighborhood. Um, that's going to be activated. So I think some people, it's a long answer, most people think immediately of the pitch. What's going to happen on the pitch? And I'm, I, yes, more. But also think of the whole stadium and the facility and how we can activate that and offer that and make it available to the people in our city and the neighborhood. For uh, Ron and Gerard, Jeff is trying to get a 2026 FIFA World Cup game here. It would be in Paul Brown Stadium where the Bengals are. As people who have only been here for a month now, I'm just curious, seeing the fan atmosphere and everything, do you think this would be a good place to host the biggest tournament in the world? For sure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, <laughs> but the, the first day, uh, um, I had this kind of hop-on, hop-off bus by the name of Jeff Birding. <laughs> and uh, the first uh, thing he showed was uh, the West End Stadium. You can see a lot now, but I think uh, it will be sensational. And it will be an honor to play there, but you can do there all kinds of events and for, for international games. I think it, it be, would be great. Or am I not understanding the question? Brown in the Bengals, so the let, let, let that's me. That's a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> that's a mistake. <laughs> uh, I, I, when I was talking, I thought maybe they mean they want to do that in the Bengals stadium. No, that's a mistake. We should do it in the West End. So we have to change that. <laughs> Sorry, Bengals. What was the reason? Uh, just to give a little bit of background for the group. <laughs> Cincinnati, uh, obviously folks know the United bid, United States, Canada, Mexico has won the rights to host the 2026 World Cup. I think there's 21 cities, maybe 22, 21, 22 cities in the U.S. that are finalists to host matches. Um, I think 17, 16 or 17 are going to win. Uh, we won't know until uh, next year in 2020. Um, they require as a part of the bid a stadium that seats at least 60,000. Uh, our stadium won't be adding 30,000 <laughs> seats. Um, so in order for Cincinnati to be a finalist, the games would be played at Paul Brown. They would put grass down, uh, and, and it would be played there. Um, but that is the reason why. Uh, I will share. Uh, part of our bid also is our brilliant training facility, the Mercy Health Training Center. 
uh, in Milford. Uh, we are 100% confident that we will be hosting, we will be a host city for the World Cup. We will see, hopefully we're hosting matches, but at a minimum we'll be a base camp, uh, we believe, uh, for a team that is coming to the U.S. to compete in uh, the games, in, in the World Cup. So, look, we have a lot of work to do, and to be fair, I call on all of our, our supporters as we continue to progress on the bid, the enthusiasm and support we've seen uh, come out of nowhere, I think for many, uh, here in Cincinnati will be a big part of us uh, hopefully winning matches here and then truly seeing the best players in the world, the best matches uh, with World Cup. Uh, yes, Ron, prefer uh, stadium, uh, West End Stadium, but at least if we were to host uh, World Cup matches, Paul Brown. Obviously, I do say, I said earlier, World Cup qualifiers, some of the lead-in games that are played prior to the start of the World Cup, I'd expect all of those to be uh, played at the West End Stadium, but final matches down the street. Yeah. Then maybe I can apologize a little bit to the <laughs> Bengals. <laughs> I've never seen an American football game yet, because in, uh, in Holland it's not a big sport. But uh, for sure, I will see an uh, American football game at the Bengal Stadium, and I will be a, a fan of the Bengals, because when you're from Cincinnati, you, you're a fan of the Reds and the Bengals, and for sure, of FC Cincinnati. So sorry, sorry, Bengals. I'm coming over if you want me. <laughs> So over the years, uh, when we've, the club first started, we had our international friendlies. So first year was Crystal Palace, over 30,000 people. Very hot, but still a great turnout for people. Then the next year was Valencia. Then pre uh, the final year in USL, Espanol. I know we had an email that went out to all of us that talked about potential for maybe English Premier League teams or maybe some other clubs. Have there been talks lately or maybe in the past, maybe bringing in a club for future international friendlies? Yes. Uh, so thank you uh, for the question. Uh, when we created FC Cincinnati, we said we want to bring the world to Cincinnati and show off Cincinnati to the world. In the Crystal Palace match, uh, at the time, the highest attended soccer match in the history of our state, 35,000, uh, for me was the aha moment. Literally, when you, people are like, when did you know you were onto something? Crystal Palace. The, the moment of Crystal Palace. I still remember my daughter tapping me on my shoulder. At the, 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 everyone was in their seats. It was a sea of blue and orange. And they went to do the anthems, right? And it was just electricity. If you were there, you felt the electricity in the stadium. And my younger uh, daughter, Grace, tapped me on the shoulder and said, look what we did. Um, and it was just, like I said, I still get uh, emotional about it. W we continued to do it in year two and three. Uh, is, is, is a way to showcase again our city and, and the sport and bring big time players. Uh, Espanol and Valencia followed up their seasons with us with, with good success. Um, this year we, we ended up bringing uh, the U.S. men's national team. Uh, obviously not in an exhibition against international uh, friendly and the answer was those survey they like to play on grass
in this market, everyone wants to play. Um, uh, they li like to... It's not just a kick and rush, uh, what you see in the, in the second tier in, in, in England, for instance. We, we can adjust in it. Needs what we, uh, uh, what we have to implement also, but in the the American market. Together with academies uh, playing on a better level when you're young. And, and I, I, I think that it, it will be huge. And, and maybe in the future, where you're not watching the Premier League. It will take some time, but I think the American market challenging. Maybe is that the same? Talking about the future and about the roster and see in the future and who we want uh, uh, to move. And that's the start from every conversation. Of course, we know. Uh, 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 for me, working with uh, uh, Luke Sosano on that, we have a, a very good understanding about uh, the rules and other people around me. Uh, we make it very I think also that uh, in, the, in the office of MLS,